Good morning and welcome to this chapel worship experience. We continue our series this morning with We Worship God and Community, which simply means that as a bright community, we are gathered each welcome Tuesday to, to worship and honor worship God community. in this space we can and wherever we might be in our homes, in our offices, wherever we gather, God, we turn to you. And so welcome to this worship experience. And we invite you to assume a comfortable position of praise, whether you're seated or standing or wherever you might be this morning, we invite you to be comfortable and go to God authentically in love and adoration. You're in for a treat. We have Chris Chisholm joining us today. And for the first time preaching at Bright, the Reverend Dr. Jeremy Williams. We're excited about what God is gonna do on this morning. And we stand in tiptoe, just excitement for what God is going to do. And so welcome to this chapel worship experience and enjoy. Chris, I believe you're muted. You're muted, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so y'all just missed all of that, like just the whole thing, but that's all right. Um, I, I was saying how good it is to be with everyone today, and it's only Tuesday, and it feels like Friday. Uh, it feels like it's already been a whole week and two days, and so I'm grateful for the goodness of God. I'm grateful that we get to together even virtually and center ourselves for this weekend. I don't know about you, but worship puts me in a place like nothing else. Worship was the true vibe. We talk a lot about vibes these days, but worship was a, a vibe within itself, and it's what, uh, it's what sustains us. It's what centers us. It's what gets us going, and I thank God for giving us the opportunity to worship for giving us the opportunity to say away with the noise of the flood. We want to hear you speak, even if that's a still, small voice.
Gracious God, it is you who created the heavens and earth, our blessed Savior and Redeemer, who took the form of our mortal flesh for just a little while, so that we may know your love and presence among us and within us. It is in your holy name that we are gathered today in this blessed community in order that we may worship you. Holy God, we acknowledge that both as individuals and as a community, we fall short of your expectations. We do not love you with all our hearts, nor do we love our neighbors as ourselves. We turn all of our love and attention to ourselves and to those who we claim, and we leave no love for the stranger in our lands. Merciful God, may you always be there to lift us up when we stumble. Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to join one another today in praise of you. We thank you for the food that nourishes our bodies and for this cool relief from the scorching Texas sun. God, we thank you for the worship community that you have gathered here today at Bright Divinity School. Faithful God, we ask that you give us the wisdom to know the right questions to ask and for the courage to seek the answers. May you grant us the fortitude to persevere in the face of mounting deadlines. Healing God, we ask that you help us in this pandemic so that we may once again gather with our physical community. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. Then a woman said, Speak to us of joy and sorrow. And he answered, Your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the selfsame well from which your laughter rises 
was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart, and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart, and you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say, joy is greater than sorrow, and others say, nay, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come, and when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed. Verily, you are suspended like scales between your sorrow and your joy. Only when you are empty are you at standstill and balanced. When the treasure keeper lifts you to weigh his gold and his silver, needs must your joy or your sorrow rise or fall. On Joy and Sorrow by Khalil Gibran Good morning, Bright Community. Uh, upcoming events, opportunities, um, reminder, Episcopal Eucharist is tomorrow at 1215 here in the chapel. Also, every Thursday at 11 a.m. is community coffee hour. Um, we really would love for you to be there. We had some great discussions a few weeks ago about local restaurants, but there are many other wonderful things going on at uh, a coffee hour. Um, so this is actually for bright students and bright community. This is really important. Um, Open House is um, on Thursday night from 6.30 to 8, and it's at Trinity Arts Pavilion. This is for folks that are interested in coming to Bright, um, have questions, get to meet um, staff, faculty, um, students. This is a great opportunity. So if you know someone in your life who is thinking about seminary, this is a great opportunity to invite them to an outdoor safe event. They do need to RSVP though. So uh, Kristen's going to put that link in the chat. So feel free to share that uh, with anyone in your life that might be thinking um, about uh, Bright in the coming, and whether in the spring or beyond. And then just a reminder, we have a lot of guests here today. And we're really, really happy you're here. We do this every Tuesday at 11 a.m. So I know you're here to hear Dr. Williams deliver an amazing sermon today. But next week, another faculty member, Dr. Shelley Matthews is going to be delivering sermon. Uh, great music. I think DeShay is doing music next week. So it's gonna be awesome. Uh, but we've got great things in store. So please make this part of your weekly ritual, 11 a.m. Tuesdays. And have an amazing rest of the uh, worship today. Glad you're here. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Bright Divinity's Chapel Worship Experience. Whether you are just tuning in now or you have been tuned in, we are thankful for your presence here where we worship God and how God is inspiring us and telling us how to create community and sustaining a better way for all of us, because we all know we're interconnected, y'all. And so it is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our musician for today, who has become a bright favorite. We have Chris Chisholm, who is a singer songwriter, who has a natural way of crossing cultural and generational barriers to reach people through his music and message. He's also a father, a husband, and now the founding pastor of the House of Dallas, an inclusive church plant that was launched in 2021. He has been named Dallas's best musician and best local singer by the Dallas Voice and was chosen as the winner of the 2019 Michael Terry Singer Songwriter People's Choice Award at the Wildfire Music and Arts Festival. And while Chris still writes and produces music this year, the majority of his attention has gone into building a new community of progressive worshipers that use culture, music, and the arts to reach those longing for spirituality, community, and inclusivity. Chris has a heart for God and for the people. 
and now uses his gift of music and songwriting to reach misfits, marginalized, and misunderstood siblings across the DFW. Will you all warmly welcome Chris Chisholm as he continues in sharing his gifts of leading worship with us? Thank you, Chris. I mute myself. Y'all would think I just started Zoom for the first time, y'all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just talking away over here. So uh, I was told that my, my sound was a little patchy. It was kind of coming in and out. So I'm uh, going to try something else that I uh, figured out where I, I could just go directly from the computer and not try to be fancy. Sometimes you have to put your fancy equipment away and just let worship be worship. So Yeah. 
And this isn't in my lyrics, but I can't help but do it. One day, when the glory comes, it'll be ours. It'll be ours. Oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure. grave clothes and I came out in a new robe. I was in that closet for so long but I come alive with the one who has conquered it all. Walked out of my grave clothes and I came out in a new robe. I was buried there for too long but I come alive with the one who has conquered it all. reading from the Gospel according to St. John. This translation is from the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney's A Woman's Lectionary for the Whole Church. And Jesus said, A little while and you all will not see me, and another little while and you all will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does this mean? that he is saying to us, a little while and you will no longer see me, and again, a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the creator? They said, what does he mean by this a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, are you all discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said a little while and you all will no longer see me and again a little while and you all will see me? Very truly, I tell you all that you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You all will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When the woman is giving birth, she has pain because her time has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the tribulation because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you all have pain now, but I will see you all again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. My friends, hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. It is with great delight that I introduce our preacher this morning. The Reverend Dr. Jeremy L. Williams is a native of Huntsville, Alabama. Dr. Williams is Assistant Professor of New Testament at Bright Divinity School, where he researches racialization and criminalization in the ancient Roman world, and how imperial and local officials criminalize the Jesus following movement in the Acts of the Apostles. Dr. Williams graduated with highest honors in religious studies and economics from Vanderbilt University, earned a Master of Divinity from the Yale Divinity School, and a PhD from Harvard. Dr. Williams is an ordained elder in full connection in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, has served as lead pastor of two congregations in Connecticut, and has served in ministry for almost 20 years. Friends, please join me in welcoming our preacher, the Reverend Dr. Jeremy L. Williams. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, to all of the worship participants, Reverend Fluker, thank you for the invitation. To my colleagues who have joined, and it's good to see in those Zoom boxes, my wife is here with us, and so many other friends who have joined us from across the nation, pastors and clergy, as well as to our students here. I'm excited to share with you from those words that we just heard. If you wouldn't mind, could you pray with me? Oh God, our source, 
I ask now that you take control of my vocal cords so that people don't hear from me, that they hear from you. Amos said, a lion has roared who can but fear. God, you've spoken, who can but prophesy. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, our hero, we pray. Amen. Amen. Indeed, as James said to John and John said to Peter and Peter said to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, it is good for us to be here. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to speak to you briefly for a few moments from this subject. Make it make sense. Jesus, journeys, and joy. Our scripture and its translation that we just heard are the reading for this week in Dr. Will Gaffney's New Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church. It's an important piece of scholarship and the translation is quite useful and clear. Now, the translation is so clear that it helps to demonstrate the lack of clarity in Jesus's words in verse 16, where John records Jesus saying, a, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. On their surface, these words are perplexing. No wonder the disciples are confused. The disciples or students of Jesus discuss amongst themselves, what in the world did these words mean? Because they're not making sense. And perhaps you have felt the same way, whether about words of God contained in scripture that lead you to ask someone else, how does this passage make sense? Or you may have felt this way in regards to the esoteric words of professors where you have to wait until after dismissal to ask your classmates, what were they talking about because that didn't make sense? Or you may have experienced this in the words of readings that introduce concepts and polysyllabic phrases that cause you to ask yourself after finishing an article, can I even read? Because that did not make sense. And, and if you've ever had those feelings and experienced them, you are not alone. Not only do you have some writers that identify with you, but you also have some other student colleagues in John's gospel, who could not make sense of Jesus's words. They, they asked each other to make sense of the words that did not seem to make sense, but they did not ask Jesus. Still, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask. And what is even more interesting for John's gospel is that Jesus is the pre-existing word of God through whom everything was created and without whom was nothing made. The one who claimed that before Abraham was, I am. Therefore, it's not too much to suspect that even before Jesus' students discussed their challenges with Jesus' words, that John's Jesus knew that they would have difficulty processing them and understanding their meaning. Yet Jesus says the words anyway. Is this because Jesus prefers for students to be in a state of confusion? Upon looking at the various complicated statements that Jesus makes, one may draw that conclusion. But there may be another reason. Could it be that Jesus says these riddling words just to appear at the end and provide the solution for them? That is plausible but it does not seem to get at the heart of it. Perhaps these words of Jesus can be linked to earlier words that Jesus says to student Thomas in John 14 and six, where Jesus communicates to Thomas and others that I am the way, the truth and the life. Now, when Jesus says, I am the way, this term can be translated not only as route, but it can also be translated as, and I prefer this translation, of journey. Jesus tells the students that I am the journey. This, this rings a bit differently than others who read this passage as if Jesus was communicating a clear-cut, narrow, exclusive route to the divine 
Rather, Jesus extends an invitation to go on a journey that is anything but clear cut. But one that may frequently feel frustrating, one that may seem circuitous, one that is broad and ever evolving. But the only sure thing about it is that each step brings you closer to the creator, or better yet, each move brings the creator closer to you. This journey is one that embodies the words from Isaiah 61. It is a journey that raises beauty from ashes, that trades a spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise. It is one that exchanges tears of mourning for the oil of joy. But this joy that the journey offers is not a straightforward kind of joy, especially in the face of what John calls the world or the cosmos, the, the current order of things. One way that we can make use of John's use of the world is by noting that it's a conflicted creation or a sick system. And in line with John's tendency to contrast terms like light and dark and death and life, John juxtaposes Jesus's serious students against the world's sick system. Jesus's serious students against the world's sick system. The sickness of the world system for John manifests in how the world has joy when Jesus' serious students don't. The world's sick system does not just rejoice when Jesus' serious students don't have it, but because they don't have it. Earlier in chapter 16, John's Jesus says that those sick in the world will attempt to criminalize and kill Jesus' students and consider those actions to be doing God a service. The world's sick joy is enigmatic because how can one find joy in killing and consider an act of worship? Please make it make sense. A sick joy arises when people invoke law and order to over-police and incarcerate others while celebrating God's grace and mercy for themselves. Make it makes sense. It's a sick joy when people can endorse state execution while praising a God who was lynched by the state. Please, please make it make sense. It's a sick joy when we begin a decades-long war with the moralizing language of fighting terror and evil, but cannot see terror and evil that we cause claiming to be one nation under God. Please make it makes sense. It's sick joy when some men consider it faith to not wear masks on their bodies, but feel like it's their God-given responsibility to tell women what to do with theirs. Please make it make sense because the rapper Drake would say that's not even in the Bible. Jesus contrasts the joy of the world's sick system to the joy of Jesus' serious students. Although the world's sick systems and institutions attempt to govern every part of our existence, Jesus' serious students are not called to cower from it, but to confront it. They are called to engage a world that is sick and bent on infecting them. See, this is, this is complicated because it is actually the model that Jesus sets for serious students to follow especially in light of the fact that it is the same world's sick system that would hate Jesus to the point that it would conspire to kill him, but it is the same world that God so loved that God gave God's only begotten child to live for it. John's Jesus suggests that this type of engagement produces a joy, and one may wonder how can such a lethal and dangerous task generate joy? make it make sense. But unfortunately, I do not claim to have the explanatory power to make it make sense. But I believe that that is actually what gives it strength to this serious student's joy. Jesus tells them that their sorrow will turn into joy. Most directly, Jesus is discussing how the sorrow from Jesus' death will be overcome by the joy of resurrection. But at this point in the narrative, that did not make sense to Jesus' serious students and especially not to the world's sick system. 
And it's found precisely in the fact that the world cannot understand this joy is why it's able to have power. The world could celebrate Jesus' death, but resurrection was coming. The sick system could rejoice at the serious student's sorrow, but joy was coming. And this aligns with the words of the psalmist who penned that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, this is not to suggest that it is necessary that pain precedes joy, which is an often parroted mantra that leads to harmful relationships to individuals, ideas, and institutions. But I believe that this passage provides something more than the notion that pain precedes joy. Rather, it shows that joy persists pain. See, it is not necessary for pain to precede joy, but, but joy persists pain. To try to further explain it, Jesus uses the sacred example of a woman giving birth to present how joy eclipses pain. And it's important that I acknowledge here as a man preacher that John and his Jesus talk about a biological process that they will never experience. And this is important to note, especially because men often use pregnancy metaphors without taking seriously the damage to women's bodies, especially black women who suffer higher rates of complications in giving birth. However, here Jesus presents the woman giving birth in spite of challenges and difficulty as the key to resolve the enigma presented at the beginning of our reading for today. The joy of new life persists tribulation. Therefore, Jesus' words at the beginning were not a misspeak. They were not a mistake. They were intentional because the joy that Jesus and Jesus' serious students wield is a puzzling type of joy. But the puzzlement is not geared directly at the students as we first discussed. No, the confusion is directed toward the world's sick system who Jesus' words don't make sense to. It does not make sense to the world how people can continue to be joyful while it constantly presents avenues of joylessness. It does not make sense to the world's sick system how people can continue to hold on to hope while hopelessness tugs at the reins. And it's precisely because the world cannot understand this hope and this joy that it does not have power to take it. Here, the wisdom of the Negro spiritual affirms this notion with words that folks from my home communities in the church I pastored could sing. They would say, this world, this joy I have. The world, it didn't give it to me. They understood that not only did the world not give it, but they knew that every chance the world had, it attempted to take what little bit of joy that they could muster, whether it was through the world's sick system of patriarchal militancy, racism intensity, economic inequality, educational inequity, environmental insensitivity, criminalization's intentionality, or healthcare's in inaccessibility. They understood that in spite of all that they could continue to have a persistent joy, recognizing Isaiah's words that weeping may endure for a night and that no weapon <laughs> formed against them could prosper because the joy that they had, the world didn't give it to them. But they could go on and sing the next part of the song and celebrate that not only did the world not give it, and even though it tries its damnedest, because the world can't understand it, the world <laughs> can't take it away. It can't understand how one can smile, even though it views their life as disposable and dispensable. It cannot understand why people organize to secure voting rights, even when opponents have more money and resources and connections. It, it cannot understand how one can continue to live in their truth and take off grave clothes when the world would prefer them to be comfortable in a lie. It, it, it cannot understand how Jesus' type of joy, it persists. It's the type of joy that persists run 
the, that persists wine running out at a party in Cana and it transforms water into wine. It's the type of joy that persists food insecurity and transformed two fish and five loaves of bread into a feast. It's the type of joy that persists sick people waiting for affordable health care at the pool of Siloam and provides healing. It's the type of joy that persists unjust legal systems that crucify minoritized human beings. And it's the type of joy that persists as God raises the dead to demonstrate that the world sixth system does not have the last word and, and in the same way the world's joy cannot make sense to Jesus' serious students, Jesus' joy can't make sense to the world and this joy that I have the world it didn't give it to me and because it can't understand it, the world can't take it away the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. like today where we've heard a such a transparent and inspiring message from our preacher the Reverend Dr. Jeremy Williams we are reminded that we are to be antithetical to the world we are to uh, do the opposite of what the world would think we would do we are to envelop each and every person the environment everything we can see and touch and smell, envelop it in Jesus's love because Jesus makes it make sense. Jesus stood before an entire world that did not accept him, did not understand him, but he knew that what he was preaching and what he was teaching was true. And he knew that the only way that our world can be healed and the systems can be healed is through action and by willing, by being willing to do whatever it takes out of love for humanity. And so on this morning, we follow in Jesus's footsteps. We are, we, we stand with him as he set before his disciples on the last night. So on that night on which Jesus was betrayed, he said with his disciples and they'd already seen everything that he had done They'd heard all of his teachings and he said to them, don't let my teachings and the way of life that I have shown you that is antithetical to the world, let that continue on. And so even after I'm not sitting with you physically, I want you to be reminded. And so at that last supper, he told them, in the days to come, you'll be tasked with doing, sharing this meal also. And so he said, he took bread and after having blessed it, he broke it and he said, this is my body that symbolizes, uh, uh, this is the bread that symbolizes my body. Would you eat? And every time you eat, remember me. 
Likewise, he took a cup that was filled with wine and he said, this wine represents my blood. And each time you drink of it, remember me. Would you eat and drink with me? God, thank you for Jesus's life. Thank you for the words that he imparted and left this world with because they make it make sense. Even though this world is filled with inequity and it's filled with pain and filled with so many things that you haven't designed this world to contain, God, we still have joy. We still have fire that burns in us that reminds us that we can't be complacent when systemic racism pervades this world. We can't be complacent when we see our brothers, sisters, and our siblings hurting. And so God, thank you for this message on this morning. And God, we thank you for Jesus's life. God, thank you for making it make sense. Amen. Your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see The goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see the goodness of God your voice for you led me through the fire in darkest nights you're a friend like no other I've known you as the father and mother I've known you as a friend oh I have lived in the good of God and so my life you have been faithful and so my life you have been so so good with every breath I am able oh I will see the goodness of God so all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able of the goodness of God and I love this part because when
some toxic theology wants to tell us that our sin and our past and our identity is chasing after us and there's this God up in heaven ready to shake that fist at us we can look back over our life and see that goodness goodness and mercy is following us all the days your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running out it's running out to me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me and all my life you have been faithful even when I'm not And all of this life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God and I have lived and I will live in the goodness of God anybody thankful for the goodness of God Reverend, Reverend Dr. Dr. Jerry Williams, Williams, thank you, thank so, you much so much for that for inspirational, that inspirational message, message today. today. Not, Not only, only did it, did it help, help us, us be inspired, inspired to remember, remember that, that we are we called, called to do uh, uh, great work on, on this earth, earth to, to heal, heal it, it. And, and to do things. God, uh, it, it also reminded, reminded us that, that you make it big sense. In a crazy, in a crazy world in which there's so, so much, much confusion, confusion and, and there's so, so much, much pain, pain. Uh, you make it make sense. And God, we are grateful. And God, we thank you. Ch uh, Chris Chisholm, as always, thank you for leading us in a phenomenal, phenomenal worship experience. You are truly gifted. And it is such a joy that you have come to co-create with Bright. And so thank you so much. Next week, we'll see you right back here at 11 o'clock. Invite your friends, family, colleagues, anyone who needs a good worship experience, and I don't know who that wouldn't be. Invite them back. We'll be hearing a message from Dr. Shelley Matthews. Also, be sure to mark your calendars for our next community conversation, which is on Tuesday, October 5th at 12 noon immediately following worship. Be sure to save the date. There will be a panel on inclusive justice and the challenges of intersectionality. Dr. Robin Henderson Espinosa, Dr. Grace G. Soon Kim, and Dr. Tommy Oradain, our very own, will be serving as panelists and our Dean Michael Miller will be moderating. So we'll see you back next week for another worship experience. Until then, may the grace, peace, glory, joy of God flank you everywhere you go. May you remember inclusive justice. May you remember that, all world, that although this world doesn't make sense, serving God always does. And doing and leading in love will always make sense. Be blessed, 
Remember that you are loved. Remember that you're not alone. And God be 